Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey, everyone. It's Michael Zapersky, and today I am here with Anita Nielsen. Anita, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to talk with you today. Yeah. So, Anita, you help organizations accelerate their sales. Tell us, what kind of organizations have you been uh, working with? So my focus is mainly B2B technology organizations. Very specifically, I work with organizations that have historically been transactional salespeople, for example, selling products or equipment, and trying to transition to more of a consultative sales model where they're actually selling services and solutions. So that's where I've had a ton of experience in the past. And that's where I tend to really enjoy working and I I can be super valuable. Got it. And let's go a little bit deeper into that. So you're kind of describing maybe how you see the challenges they have. What are the challenges that your clients, like they're actively looking to solve? What do you say are some of the, like, the common pain points that they're facing? Yeah. The one that I always hear is, you know, our sales reps don't know how to consistently articulate value, right? Like I wish that that was a cliche. It's not, it's very real. And so that's probably the top one um, them address. And then the second one is, of course, you know, how do we help engage sales professionals and retain them? And then just the last one is a training. And when they do invest in sales training, it doesn't stick. So it's like a sunk cost essentially is what ends up happening. So those are probably the three major um, challenges that I, I work with and that I think salespeople have, sales leaders have across the board. Yeah. So let's talk about a few of those, at least a couple of them. In terms of making sure that you said sales training sticks, right? A lot of consultants are delivering trainings or workshops you know, for their clients. And ultimately, we all should be uh, focused on making sure that clients right, are, are getting great results and there's a real impact happening there. So what have you done or what have you found that's really helped your clients to see results you know, for, for the, um, the work you're putting into to stick, as you called it? What, what are some of the best practices? So for me, I mean, I feel like for me, it's an only practice, right? The first thing I'll do is I go in and I spend at least a day doing a discovery with the reps, right? So this, and then I give them kind of my customers a list. I want your top sales rep. I want your lowest sales rep. I want the people that are high potential. I want the negative net. I want the person that is the high energy. I get to know them. And then from there, I kind of understand what prevents them from applying some of the things they've learned in the past. And I also kind of build a relationship. So when I go into the class, I'm I'm able to deliver that content in the instructor-led training. But I also build in at least two sessions for each rep. And I don't typically train classes more than like 20 reps. So two hours worth of time with me one-on-one to either look at how they're applying those skills and that knowledge in an opportunity, or is there something that they're struggling with that they need help resolving and then I can bring in the things that I've taught them. So beyond that, I also have to spend some time with the sales leader, right? So whether that's the SVP of sales or CRO, or it's the... um, you know, the frontline managers and just kind of teaching them, hey, this is where you're going to reinforce this, right? In your one-on-ones, these are the questions you're going to ask. And then it becomes part of the vernacular and it becomes part of their um, culture. And so I think that's really interesting, right? So what I'm hearing you say is like you're doing a deep dive into the key players, both the ones that are not performing as well and the ones that are performing really well, right? And then bringing that back to the the sales leader. Um, So they have a very clear understanding of, of all that. But I could still see the potential for the sales leader or the organization to have all that great information and not necessarily act on it, or I think more common, not you know act on it or or kind of implement it consistently. So, what have you found that works best for you? Kind of the best practice to ensure that your clients are not just getting that great information that you've identified and discovered, but they're actually acting on it and implementing on it consistently. Yeah. So I've been very blessed. So. In almost all the situations where I've delivered a class, I've ended up working with that sales leader on an ongoing basis. So they've become a retained client for their coaching for that sales leader to help guide them in that role. So that's been wonderful. And for the ones that hasn't, I'll do my typical every couple of months, hey, just check in to see how it's going, or I'll forward some content that applies directly to something that I trained in the class. Or a lot of times on LinkedIn, I have connections with those sales reps out there. So I'll just say, hey, have you been using this? And then I'll reach out back to the sales leader. The, the trick is, as much as that discovery helps me, it makes me invaluable to that sales leader, right? Because I go in and talk to these people and it's in confidence. Um, I don't share anything that they say, but I get an impression of what's going on in that sales organization back to the engagement and I, that I can then use to help guide the sales leader. Now, I can't tell them exactly what I heard because I wouldn't be much of a coach if I did that, but I can give them some insight into the things that, um, are potentially preventing their people from succeeding and from growing. 
And the discovery that you're providing, uh, that's a paid discovery offer. And do you package that as a kind of a standalone, like the first thing you do before doing the rest of the training, or is that actually part of the training itself? It's well, it's a bundle. It's it, I won't do one without the other. So I will not go in and train a training class cold without at least um, you know having a few hours to meet with some key players in the audience. I mean, it's just if I want things to actually change, then I need to go in there with some buy-in in advance. And listen, we all have our strengths. One of my strengths is relating to people. So if I get in there and I've even got the negative net of the class, who's probably going to be the heckler, and I've got him to under her to understand that I'm here to help, that makes for a much more productive class. You also mentioned that many of your clients take the experience you've gone in and you've done the kind of train the trainer or a workshop around, around sales and the training then the, those leaders actually become your long-term kind of ongoing clients. What have you found that's helped that? Like, are you very direct as part of your presentation or part of that, let's say that, that workshop or that training to make the recommendation that you continue on coaching with you? Or is it just a natural, the kind of transition where the sales leader says, yeah, this is really great. How do we continue? Like, what have you found has worked best for you to create those long-term kind of ongoing relationships? Yeah. Again, I'm pretty lucky in that it, it's natural. Like I, one thing I'm blessed about is I don't have to do a whole lot of like selling, selling, right? I love to when I get a chance, but I think the thing that makes me invaluable to customers is that once I get involved with them, it becomes very obvious to them quickly that I am devoted to helping them be successful and that there is not a stone I'll leave unturned. Now, strictly thinking about it from a customer perspective, once you find somebody like that, you don't want them to go away, right? Because it's hard to find people that are that staunch advocate for you. So because of that, I think it becomes a natural conversation. But I'm not above asking for it if it doesn't. Right. So let's say yeah, you went into a training, you gave a, you know, you felt it went really well, the client got good results, but they didn't necessarily say to you, you know, hey, Anita, let's continue on or what do things look like next? What would you do? What would be kind of the, the step that you would take to try and create the next opportunity together or to continue? Yeah. So good question. So I think depending on the situation, I, I would hope that I've gleaned some information or insight into their sales organization that I can then position back to that sales leader and say, Hey, listen, you guys are going to do a great job getting through XYZ. Remember though, after that, you have to do ABC and understand that I'm happy to help. Um, and I've found that sales leaders typically can use the help to accelerate the um, adoption and how the content is received. So know that that's an option. I'm happy to continue partnering with you to help the organization be successful outside of a training class, more of a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, and it's, and it works. <laughs> that works. So Yeah, good. Awesome. You also talked about the one of the challenges that your clients are kind of bringing you in, in for is they're not necessarily good at communicating value, right? The salespeople. That's a big challenge for just consultants as, as well, right? What have you found are some of the tried and true ways that even you yourself, like in your business or your, your clients are able to communicate more valuable what you're doing in a way that's actually relevant for you know, the marketplace? Yeah. So it's interesting that I actually care so much about this idea of value that that's what I pretty much based a book, my book on, right? So the idea is that, you know, there's a value that a company creates for whatever they're selling. There's a value that product inherently has in it. But then there's the value that the individual who's selling brings to the equation, not just in the case of a consultant. And that is a personalized value. And that's basically a function of who you are, what you stand for, and how you make that meaningful in the context of your customer's success. So what I mean by that is, when we go in to talk to customers, we understand pretty quickly what their needs are, their objectives, and their challenges. But I want more than what they need. When I'm working with them and I'm learning kind of where they're at, I want to know what they want. What are they wishing for? What do they desire? And then it becomes my mission to you know, table stakes, make them succeed on what their objective is. But then if I know that they want a promotion, then I'm figuring out exactly how they're going to get it. And I'm going to help them do it. So it's creating that personalized value based on what I know matters most to them. Typically on an emotional level is where that differentiation lives. And how do you identify that, right? So... I think a lot of people will be listening and going, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I need, I know that I need to focus more on value. I need to communicate that. Some people might even be quite experienced. You know, they've been building their consulting business for five, 10 years, whatever it might be, but they, they recognize that their messaging is, is still at a very surface level. So what should they do for someone, whether they're, they're getting started or they're, you know, a veteran in consulting, but they want to just strengthen their message, make it more compelling, uh, have it align better with their ideal clients. What do they need to do? Do they just like contact people? Do they call them up? Do they set meetings? Do they, 
just take a guess? Like, what have you found actually works best to to identify like those true emotional pain points? Yeah. So, well, so first off, just for me as a consultant, one of the things that I had to do early on was I I kind of interviewed and surveyed my customers because I wanted to know why they bought from me because that's where my messaging lives, right? Like I can speculate all day and I've gotten pretty good at it, but I want to hear from them. What is she good at? And by and large, that comes back as, you know, she's not going to let me fail or uh, she'll leave no stone unturned. So those are things very naturally come from the customers. And how did you do that? Like, how did you go about doing that survey or, in, or interview? Was it online? Was it in person? Just walk us through like what the... It was a 360 assessment that I did. And so basically I sent it to my customers and it's, it's to create self-awareness. And uh, they have an ability to answer some questions just on basic things like the integrity of your work, you know, the follow-up and all the, the basics of, that we ha- have to deliver. But then it also talks about what was it specifically that it, you know, endeared her to you or things of that nature. And then that is the information that I take and then find a way to message. Because realistically, that's the value. All of us are consulting. We're all trying to create value. We're all using our expertise and knowledge to help customers be better. But we are all doing that, right? So two things that will work in your favor, know your niche, and then know what your customers find valuable, and then be able to go message that. That's yeah, so important. I mean, messaging is, is so key. Uh, in all aspects of, of business, right? And communicating your value, being able to generate leads and, and inquiries. And so many people just kind of live at that superficial or surface level where their message could essentially be anyone else's message. There's no differentiation. But if you take the time, as Anita's suggesting here, to really understand what is it that your ideal clients truly care about, then your message will stand out and you'll be able to to see really like significantly greater results. So I, I love that. Let's talk about how did you get into the world of sales consulting? Now, you, you talked about having a maybe negative experience at one job. Like just kind of talk us through what things looked like for you before you got into sales consulting. Sure. And um, I hope this will inspire some people that uh, second guess themselves. But I worked for a corporation that I was a sales enablement consultant. And I worked for them for with large customers just to help understand their current challenges and help define a new selling system. Um, at one point, I worked with an amazing customer medical device manufacturer, huge name. And um, of course, I did what I do. I go in, build a relationship, look at everything. They know that I want them to succeed. I'm a partner for them. And I come back and I'm getting ready to do my recommendations. And my boss says, here's a 64-page template that you need to put your thoughts into. I mean, I was flabbergasted. I said, okay, first of all, if I take that template that was created as a template for everybody and bring that back to my customer who I've spent the past six weeks working my butt off for. They're going to ask who I am and what I've done with Anita, right? And um, he, he couldn't grasp that. And so finally, I said, and, and my customer was hilarious. My customer was backing me on it. They said, you know what, if you... I told them, I said, I'm, I'm going to leave the company. I apologize. And I was honest with them. I said, okay, well, we're going to talk to the lawyers and see if we can have you come just work with us directly, which I never did. I would never do that. But it was interesting that it mattered more to them that their partner was looked after than their relationship that they already had with that company. So that was... um, And I left the company. I've never, since I was 15 years old, not had a job. So this was devastating. I mean, if I look at it from an emotional standpoint, I was depressed. What do I do with myself? How long did you feel depressed for after you left that company? It was probably about three months, at least, where I was just kind of like, woe is me. You know, What am I going to do about this? And then... Well, so I always had that idea in my head of, you know, well, you could go out on your own. But I'll be honest with you, I'm chicken. Like I was scared to do that. But then I said, no, it's now or never. You're about to be 40. If you don't do this now, you're going to always regret that you didn't do it. That was five and a half years ago. And so I went out, I created my LLC. I did a ton of research. I followed some brilliant minds in my space online, made some great connections. And then when people that I had worked with in the past found out that I was now on my own, I started getting inquiries. and And I built my customer base like that. And then they were first. How did they find out I needed it? Was it like, were you now posting on... LinkedIn or Facebook or like how do people know that Anita is now open for business? While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, 
developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. So the, the main place that I advertised was LinkedIn and it was really just a, my voice saying, hey, I've been through some crazy times and I am now on my own. I'm so excited and you know, I'm looking forward to potentially working with some of you people. And so a bunch of people came to me and I did some outreach at that point, right? Like some past connections and you know, I, not necessarily much of that panned out for anything significant, but there was a few people who saw that they worked with me in the past and said, okay, I'm in a new company. I need you to get in here and help me. And so I was really blessed in that way. But it was LinkedIn primarily that I used. Right. And you shared with me before we kind of hit record here that most of your business has just been coming in through referrals. You haven't had to do tons of, of outreach or, or sales activities yourself. Just talk us through you know, what your mindset is around that. Do you feel that that's a good place to, to be? Are you thinking now more about trying to do kind of more proactive marketing? What's going on in your world right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I... I think it kind of hits to the heart of where I'm at right now. So historically, the business has been 100% referral, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. So it's a blessing because, yay, people see my value and they're willing to stick with me and find me other customers. But the flip side of that is I don't have confidence that that lasts forever. Right? Things change. And so in my mind, a couple of years ago, I said, you need to get your marketing game up and you need to start doing more outreach. And not even though I focus on my customers a lot, I had to focus on myself and my business as well. And so the investment that I made at that point, I made some general investments in terms of contacts and magazines and such. But the biggest investment I made was writing the book, right? And actually sitting down and sharing my expertise and content from my classes in that book. And what ended up happening is that that became my single biggest marketing tool. And a lot of the awareness I've created now has been through that book. So I'm currently in the process of beginning stages of marketing myself, right? Like I've had a website forever, but really targeting my message and reaching out to different individuals. And LinkedIn is my primary source of people. I mean, I I just have no interest in randomly going out and finding people. I know the types of organizations I excel at. And those are the ones that I've been starting to reach out. And it's been good so far. I mean, so far I've got a couple of really good leads. But again, this is new to me. I haven't done this in a long time. So it's going to be interesting to see how I pull through it. But I look at it this way. I've, so far, I've been able to step up on every occasion that I've needed to, even though I sometimes doubted myself. And this is going to be no different. Well, happy to chat with you as well, Bull Doc. Definitely can uh, can offer some some guidance and ideas around that. So, how are you currently kind of using the book? And tell us. You said the book has had you know there's been a good kind of response from it. There's lots of people. I've mentioned this before, but like a lot of people write books, they don't necessarily get good results from them. They're not marketing them. So. What have you done specifically kind of with the book or how have you found that you've been able to use it in an effective way? So the first thing I did with the book is when I knew that it was going to be coming out, I reached out to almost all of my LinkedIn contacts and I sent them an email. I'm a very personal one saying, you know what? I'm finally going to finish this book. I need your help. Can you help me talk about the book on LinkedIn and you know pass it around? And sure enough, because of the commitment that I'd made to those people in the past and how I'd worked for them, they were... I was overwhelmed at how willing they were to go out there and recommend my book. And before I knew it, I had some reviews on Amazon, which I never, <laughs> I never thought that was going to happen. But I think when you do genuinely care for people and, and their success, ultimately, when it comes your turn, they, they will find a way to help you. So I've been really lucky with that. I've made a lot of great contacts with mentors over the years. So I had to do a lot of learning when I first went out on my own, just to put some discipline around the way that I delivered my services. And those individuals who I'd always been grateful to, and I was vocal about how grateful, they came in in droves to help me. And then I joined a group called Women Sales Pros, um, which I think you've interviewed many of of them in the past. And that was a group that has been incredibly helpful just in terms of, you know, hey, you have to get her book or, you know, hey, I'm reading your book. I sent it to this customer. So it really has been a product, again, of relationships that I've cultivated over the years. Yeah, it's so key to surround yourself with others. You know, whether it's in some kind of like a mentorship group or just people working in similar industries, but always just 
for many consultants, the work that we do can be lonely. It can be ourselves, but finding people that you can learn from or surround yourself with, that kind of community is, is so beneficial. We see that with a lot of our, our clients and the coaching programs that we run. Um, on your website, Nina, you have, I think, four core service offerings. So there's sales training, sales performance coaching, general sales enablement, and then kind of your proprietary training. Why those four? Why not six or, or two? Those are the four, and I actually might trim them down even further um, for 2020, but those are the four that I know that I can be amazing at. I mean, frankly, they're the ones that will get me the kinds of customers I want to work with. And they're the ones that are proven and jive with who I am and what I stand for. Like You'll never see on my website somebody that's going to help with commissions and figuring out compensation. That will never be a thing for me, right? So it took energy and time to figure out what am I good at? What do I know I can go in there and just make inimitable value? And those are the four that I landed on. And I'll be honest, you know, the general services, that might change in 2020 because that feels a little bit general. And I'm understanding that the more I focus and the more I'm able to take the expertise from that niche and apply it, the more valuable it's been in general for me and the customer. And then so what do you say to the consultant listening right now who goes, yeah, but if I narrow down too much, like I'm missing out on the potential business and shouldn't I let people know that I can do all these other things as well? How would you respond to them based on your experience with that? It's scary, right? So first I'll acknowledge how scary that is. I mean, when you're trying to pay bills, you're pretty much like any project. And I did this, by the way, any project that I get my hands on, I'm going to take it because it's going to be a check. Well, What ends up happening is when you go out on your own as a consultant, you have dreams and goals and you have an idea in your head of of what that business looks like. Well, when you take on that business that isn't going to jive with what you wanted, you're going to be unhappy until you go back and focus on those things that you know you can be uniquely valuable on. It'll just be be like a rat race. And then you're going to be ready to go back and work for somebody else because the whole reason that you go out on your own is you want to do work that you love, right? Or a big reason. And if you start doing work that you don't love, then why not just go back and get a job and have a steady income, right? So I I say that um, it's hard, it's scary, but have faith in yourself and your skills to be able to actually go out and make something of it and know that you will based on your ability to focus. Yeah, definitely. And I think it also goes towards mastery, right? Like if you want to really be known as a a master in a certain area, an expert in a certain area, then you, you have to narrow in. You can't do too many things. If you do, then there's no way that you can be an expert in, in all of them. And then the other thing that I've share with many clients is this idea that if you go out and you're doing a lot of different types of things and you're building different case studies that are like, it's varied, right? So when you want to then ultimately attract one specific type of ideal client, it's hard to to demonstrate it to to show a lot of similar case studies because your case studies are so wide ranging. Right, exactly. But if you have, you know, um, a whole bunch of case studies around, let's say one or two or three specific areas, then those you'll be able to attract, you know, those types of clients in droves because they're really seeing more specific proof of what you've done in that area. Yeah, they're seeing your value in the context of people like them, right? And that's, that's very attractive, right? Like that's what's going to get people to buy is knowing that you've helped people just like them be better. That comes back, come, comes back to the messaging too, right? Like that whole idea of that your ideal clients want to be able to see themselves in your messaging. And so the more specific that you can be about that, the more likely it is that it's going to resonate with them. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with um, individuals, especially in sales that, you know, they'll do outreach and it'll be very much, my name is so-and-so, this is my title, this is the company I work with, this is what we deliver. And I'm just like, delete. Or like, so what? I mean, anybody can cut and paste that information into an email and, and try to go in my junk folder. But what's different is, you know, reaching out and saying something like, I recently worked with SMB a medium-sized business in B2B tech, and we were able to see a 20% increase in revenue just from a two-day class over the course of a year, right? Now I've got their attention and I've gotten it in a big way. And it becomes very easy to ask for that call. 100%. So looking back over the last, let's say, 12 months or so, what, do you, what would you say has kind of like been the biggest impact and benefit that you know, something that you've done or something that you've, you've learned, you've implemented into your business that's just had that the, kind of the biggest impact for you? I think the book, I mean, hands down, I had, I did it because I wanted to help salespeople. That's, that was what the heart of it was. But I did not realize the overwhelming support that it was going to get and how much people were going to benefit from it and actually use it. So that was an awakening for me, right? And I think over the years, I've worked really hard on my self confidence. And that was huge for me. It's like, you know what? It's not just in your head that you know things, people appreciate what you know and there's value to it. So, I think that was probably the most um, high impact thing that I did in, in so many ways in the past year. 
just talk to, to me for a minute about like the, the whole, the self-confidence, self-esteem, that, that area, because so many people struggle with that. And like, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. What were you going through? Just take us like into the mind of a needle a little bit more. Like, what, what were some of the thoughts you were having at that time, especially? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I'm sure a majority of the people on the phone, on the uh, podcast have heard about imposter syndrome, right? So I, I used to joke that I'm the poster child for imposter syndrome. Like no matter how great I would do, no matter how many thousands of dollars people were willing to pay me, I still was second guessing, oh my God, oh my God, am I going to be able to deliver the value? And ultimately it was the mindset. It was a shift in mindset that, you know what, people want to buy you and don't underestimate that. And so when I kind of started to think that way, it really helped alleviate with it. But now listen, I'm always working on things like this, right? Like that's just, it's, you know, your scripts are written in your childhood and you're spending the rest of your life trying to grow and learn from them. So it's, it's an ongoing effort, but it was a shift in mindset to say, you know what, you, you do get it. And guess what? They're telling you that you get it. So don't get in your own way. And I think that's kind of how um, it went through. Have you adopted or used any kind of way of thinking or a principle or let's say some kind of action that has helped you like with this? Like, do you tell yourself certain things? Have you, are there certain books that you read that have really helped you? Are you meditating? Are you like, you know, what, what, what are you doing that, to help you to go from this idea of, you know, the, the imposter syndrome or just other kind of challenges around self-esteem to actually being able to improve, like see improvement? It's a good question. So a couple of things I do. One thing I do to help balance me is I have about a 15 minute period of time in the morning where I, I'm just gratitude, right? Like I'm just grateful for these customers I have that are willing to go out and find me more customers. And I think coming to your day with that mindset is huge in terms of just getting you on the right track for the day, right? Because when you're grateful, abundance follows, right? So without getting too mushy on you, but I think that's, that's a huge thing that I do to help myself. Are you journaling or are you sending like, oh, no, I sit, there and, or what? sit there and think through it. So I just really go through and think through it. Now, someday I maybe will be disciplined enough to write it, but so far it's kind of like wherever my mind takes me in terms of what I want to be grateful. Like some days it might be, I might be grateful that I can have a conversation with my teenage daughter without killing her. Right? Like it just depends on what that situation is and where your, where your head takes you is where your heart needs to be in that point. So I do that. And then really just when I get to a point where I'm starting to question myself, I have a bunch of surveys that I've done from my classes and they have feedback in them from sales reps. So I will go open those and read them and say, okay, listen, this is from your people, the people that you serve. They are coming back and telling you that they've never been in a better class. They are telling you that they can't wait to use what you're saying. Do not get in your own way. Right. So I think that's probably the second most important thing that I do. And, and lastly, I mean, I keep really good connections. I, I, I surround myself with people that are very supportive that don't let me forget that I have value. So in case I do backtrack, there's people that'll say, no, 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 you are a star and you're going to continue being a star. Just don't get in your own way. Yeah. You, I mean, typically like the person that we see in the, the mirror is our own biggest critic, right? And uh, the person that's holding us back more than anything else. And oftentimes it's easy to put that externally and say, yeah, it's, it's, you know, this person or that person or this situation or cause I'm in this location or like whatever this, these external circumstances, but really the thing that's holding you back more than anything else is the person that you're looking, you know, you see in the mirror, which is yourself. So, um, yeah, great, great lesson there. I think really good ideas. Anita, how can people learn more about your book and about the work that you're doing? Where's the, the, the best place for them to go? I'm most active on LinkedIn, probably Anita Nielsen with LDK Advisory Services. That is um, ldkadvisoryservices.com is my website. And the book is on amazon.com. It's called Beat the Bots, How Your Humanity Can Future Proof Your Tech Sales Career. Very cool. Awesome. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Again, thank you so much for coming on here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com.